the struggle was not red I experienced it being deprived being oppressed even confused it's enough now we're taking the power back we're stronger than before we're proud proud of too strong the worst is over from Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the Azapo Online Political Education Platform. And uh, today uh, we are um, continuing with our um, post-election um, review. My guest for today's discussion is uh, Ongama Timka, and we are going to be discussing elections, power, development, and Ongama will be giving us uh, his uh, perspective on the on the subject. Uh, for those of you who do not know, um, my name is uh, Simphue Ashe. I am a member of the Azanian People's Organization, and um, I run this uh, platform every Sunday at 2 p.m. This is where we educate for liberation, and we hope that we are, you know, changing your your view on issues and um, educating you about uh, things um, Azania and what is happening in our country. But about Ongam Amtinka, he is a strategist and an entrepreneur uh, with many years of experience in marketing communications, executive support and small business development services. Um, he is the Uh, founder of a an organization that he runs called he, which he calls a Laula Group, for which he is the chief executive uh, officer. Ongama is a prolific uh, writer, researcher, and uh, political analyst that is based at the Nelson Mandela University in Kabecha, uh, South Africa. He has um, regular appearances on the top two 24-hour national TV news channels in the country, and that is the ENCA and the SABC. He analyzes major political trends um, on a weekly basis on the country's uh, second uh, biggest radio station, Umflobo NNFM. He does um, consulting work on uh, to development finance agencies and government organizations aimed at uh, boosting entrepreneurship in South Africa. Pongama is also you know, completing his PhD. He has uh, attended and presented at international conferences in Brazil and the United States of America, and has been on official trips to India, Switzerland, and Eswatini and other countries. He has uh, many years of um, working experience in the industrial development, local government and community development sectors, positioning him well to consult on a wide range of issues. And over the years, he has worked in um, communications, executive support and small business development services, as I indicated earlier. Um, the Laula Group um, is a company that, um, supports new ventures and expansion projects. And um, his PhD explores the political economy of transformation in the construction sector. He has uh, completed the internationally acclaimed Amtretech Entrepreneurship Development Program, which has been developed by UNCTED and a competency certificate in strategic management from Rhodes uh, University Business School. He holds a BA degree in journalism from Rhodes University and a master's degree in South African politics and political economy from the Nelson Mandela University. <clears throat> he has um, taught economics and business economics, journalism and politics at uh, the University of um, Nelson Mandela. Ongama is, um, well, has worked in retail and farming family business from 
when he was uh, 14 years um, old until he graduated from university. He chairs the, the boards of directors of uh, Bupilo Center and Isidima Development Council. He was recognized as a top 40 under 40 in Nelson Mandela Bay by the city's business uh, chamber in 2011. So that is um, our guest for this afternoon. Um, a good afternoon and a special welcome to you, Ongama. We really look forward to your views and uh, perspective on the topic of our discussion this afternoon. And uh, welcome to the Azapo Online Political Education Platform. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I had known, I would give you a shorter bio, which is meant for academic purposes. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, I am quite grateful for that span of, you know, <clears throat> things that I've done, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm honoured to be here today to chat to you or, or chat on your platform. No, no, great. And um, I think let's get to it. And uh, elections, power, and development, and. I do know that uh, you have written quite extensively on the uh, outcomes of the recent um, November 1 local government elections, and uh, you've given yourself uh, the country a perspective on your thoughts and ideas around that. And uh, I am aware that uh, you have touched uh, a lot um, more on, on the elections, but also you know, the power dynamics uh, coalitions and, you know, just about the development of their country. And I am very keen to hear your thoughts around, um, you know, these um, aspects and just give us your perspective, maybe as an introduction to this conversation. Sure, thanks a lot, uh, sir. Uh, it's an honor once again to be here and sorry for the, uh, you know, uh, delayed start from my end at still driving home while we were getting started. But I hope uh, the colleagues will find the input meaningful enough. Elections, power, development, this is quite an interesting topic. So I come from a school of thought that believes in the primacy of politics and development. Um, that uh, at the core, so it, it's not an opposite of uh, economic determinism, you know, but uh, it, it, it's, an it's an appreciation of the mutual causal relationships between the political order of a country and its uh, economic um, outlook. So, so, so I've devoted a lot of time studying the link between politics and development. And it's been quite interesting, you making reference to my PhD, looking at the political economy of transformation in Nelson Mandela Bay. What One thing has become very clear there among some of the findings, and I'm busy with my final, final chapters, uh, is that political institutions are created on the basis of the political and economic imperatives of the day. So who's in, who's out, uh, who wants to displace who forms a very crucial aspect of the making and remaking of political economic institutions. And so I, I, I believe that in, in broad terms. When it comes to elections, the elections, I've held this view and, I've, and I'm happy to have shared it on a number of platforms that the South African political economic system is undergoing a long-term period of transition. In terms of which one evident trend is the decline of the dominant party system. And what is happening at the level of smaller parties is a period that I call dynamic fragmentation. And at the level of the opposition, the higher number opposition, where we're, we're, we're seeing a period of implosion and, and its consequences, but also marginal growth. So if you allow me, uh, let, 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 let me talk about, and, and, I've, and for, for now for the past two, three years, I've been speaking to either business sector, business sectors that want to understand inherent political risks for their businesses, 
or other stakeholders who are keen to understand what their role is um, and talking about these dynamics that I'm going to be talking about today, which were confirmed by the recent elections. The first one is the issue of the decline of the dominant party. This is something that has been written about a lot in looking at post-independence Africa and post-colonial South Africa. First of all, the key for us political scientists is to what extent do uh, governments in post-colonial states retain certain colonial institutions or do away with them? And to what extent does whatever e e e chosen path e e remain sustainable and over what period and what are the drivers of uh, uh, you, you, the success or lack thereof of whatever that period that, that 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 chosen path is. So when it comes to dominant party, we've looked at it from the perspective of liberation movements in government, and a, a theory has come around the twenty-year lifespan of liberation movements and how things start falling apart. Uh, in fact, within the twenty years, to the extent that by the year twenty you begin to see a, a, a emergence of a, a, another system, either reverting back to authoritarianism uh, or multi-party democracy or whatever the case may be. But it has latent risks for social, well, socioeconomic well-being, whatever the, 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 the emergent political order gets to be. For South Africa, we've seen that the key drivers of the decline of the dominant party system without necessarily being limited by the theory of liberation movements in power has been the decline of the ANC. And the decline of the ANC is driven mainly by the rise of uh, politics of money, particularly where you find that what Joseph wrote about in Nigeria the system of pre-bandalism, where you find that office becomes a platform for use by whoever is the office holder, uh, you know, for, for self-gain or for pet, 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 patron-client relationships, where you find that those who stand to benefit from occupying a particular office use whoever occupies the office for their own agenda. Sometimes that agenda is an ethnic agenda. Sometimes that agenda is a particular aristocratic, the emerging, emergent aristocrats or emergent oligarchs, uh, as in the case of Russia and what uh, elements of what we are seeing today. Uh, but there's always an agenda that's captive, that holds the office holder captive to their interest. Now, before I, I, I legitimize counter narratives about dealing with state capture in South Africa. There are always two dimensions to this interest that capture uh, political offices. One, some of them benefit from the system to the extent that they don't need to fiddle with particular transactions or decisions that ministers take because they benefit from an overarching political economic system that's geared for their favor. And uh, in order to create that system, you need laws of the republic, you need acceptance of a particular ideological framework in this, in our case, it's neoliberalism, whatever the case may be. So people who benefit from the system do not need to fiddle with who gets to be the next minister because whatever the changes at the level of actors, they don't fundamentally affect the, the political economic order of the day, whether it's a, 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 a democracy with a strong capitalist you know, a, a, a agenda, whatever the case may be, people who control the system have no benefit controlling who gets to be, what decisions are made at a micro level, okay? But the kind of state capture that we've seen and that I'm talking about in terms of the relationships between politics and economy is the one where you find that whoever is the captive force has got a direct benefit on specific transactions. 
and 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 in my view is that the ANC has seen greater consequence from its capture by people who intend to benefit from specific transactions than it has from white monopoly capital. And I say that without any fear of contradiction. White monopoly capital controls the political, the overarching political system and doesn't really, it, it, you may see them finance campaigns of political parties and stuff, but the kind of destructive, uh, in, in my view, the destructive relationship between money and politics has come more from people who needed certain decisions to be taken by specific ministers to advance their own businesses. And that happens at a national, provincial, and, and local level. At a local level, it's more consequential because this is where killings of politicians happen because a particular nexus of business interests, uh, sorry, arrangement of business interests, or what we've called power constellation, that loses out when a particular ward councillor wins a ward versus another, or when a particular regional leader becomes the leader versus another. So the point I'm making is that even beyond theories of how long liberation movements last in power, there has been localized dynamics of uh, the implosion and in, and in fact, what I call momentum of self-destruction of the governing party, the ANC, which has got more localized dynamics of contestation over control of resources than those who control the system like one monopoly capital. So, so uh, or, or whoever is the emergent national capital that control that benefits from the system itself. So what accounts for the erosion of the ANC in my view, and its, elect, its long-term electoral decline is the nexus between emergent business interests and, the, and their corresponding political counterparts, which make the ANC in the short to long, long medium term up until to 2029, an irredeemable organization, which is why the, de the decline of party dominance um, is not going to be something that can be reversed by renewal in a five-year period. So, and then let me go to the opposition. So, so the results then, I have a manifestation of the internal wars of the party, which have translated into collapses of municipalities across the country and, 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 and uh, formation of splinter parties and the rise of civic movements. When it comes to the main opposition parties, the dominant ones, the DA and the EFF, the DA, again, its electoral performance is a function of the implosion of the party over the past two or three years. Since the conference that where diversity was included as part of the values of the DA. Now, the DA had been in a long-term transformation process triggered by Helen Zille. Helen Zille realized that in order for the DA to become a governing party in South Africa, it needed to attract the black vote. And to do so, she was quite aware that they needed to transform the leadership of the party in order to do so. However, the kind of transformation that the DA elite envisaged was one that was not going to result in contestations over the soul of the party, but uh, holding that constant while continuing to sell a message to the electorate that we're doing things well in the Western Cape, but we're also transforming to become broad church enough so that the majority can trust, could trust the party. Obviously, when it attracted black leaders, they, it, 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 and, and, and it was condescending of them, the political elite in the DA, among the white establishment in the DA, to think that there could be black people who could be attracted into the party but would not contest, contest the soul of the party, the value offering of the party. So when it became apparent that Musima Imani, among others, was not going to be that kind of a leader, uh, 
it started the, the, the and, and, and the DA included and at its conference, I think it was between 2017 and 2018, I can't remember now the exact year, the, the party included diversity as a victory for the center leftists as limited as that is in the DA, right? Uh, I'm talking about, let me call it them the reformist, my money and company. When they succeeded to transform the soul of the party by inserting diversity as its key values and leading up to the, conf to the elections in 2019, coming up with diversity as a key criteria for selecting leadership. It did what I wrote in the paper ahead of the elections, that it was going to alienate a certain section of the white voter base. But my view was that they needed not pull back from that direction because if they do it, they alienate that vote and they, that voter base departs from it. The DA could actually become a party that could attract a truly centrist, uh, 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 it could be a, a home for, for centrist politics. And if it continued to do those racial transformations, it would become increasingly trusted, especially by the urban black middle class and would grow despite losing a, 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 the fraction of the white voter base that felt threatened by diversity politics within the DA. However, when they lost the section fraction of supporter supporters to the Freedom Front Plus, the so-called strategists freaked out and wanted to reclaim the narrow base of the party as opposed to having faith in a broader politics of broad church and attracting a wider base. And in the short term, in my view, and it looks like this is gonna be a long-term trend, they shot themselves in the foot by wanting to pursue a tiny fraction of the white supporter base that felt alienated by the fact that the party started to talk the language of diversity among other things. So the DA, uh, I said they were going to lose support even more and we're going to fail in convincing the Freedom Front Plus voters uh, that they had now transformed enough. So that's what they've done. They've aborted that project. In fact, Helen Ziller is gonna go down in history as a very interesting person, triggers a very exciting process, which was always doubted of transforming a previously white party and, and, and pushing against criticism to achieve that, but only to panic later on and erode that very same legacy that could be attributed to her. Uh, and in fact, it's not like she was quietly allowing Musi to be. She was decampaigning them, which showed that they, she was never comfortable with the black leadership in the DA that was going to contest the soul and the core offering of the DA, which is why the DA finds itself where it is. I'll be quick in talking about the EFF, the EFF, um, I think we're always going to see marginal growth. In, in South Africa, there's always been space for parties on the left of the ANC. However, while the rhetoric of um, Africa belongs to black people has got a space in our politics, throughout history, it always failed to generate traction beyond integrationist politics. So the EFF's growth is always gonna be marginal because it appears to me that South Africans prepare a more integrationist approach to citizenship uh, while appreciating the need for transformation. And then let me talk about, before I, I come I back to you, sir. so their growth, I mean, I thought that they were largely going to be a growth story, but it's interesting that it looks like the stagnation in other areas, notwithstanding the fact that it's a net, it's a net benefit for the party, but I was shocked to see that it's also battling to grow significantly more than the marginal, much more than what I thought was going to be a significant marginal growth. At the level of smaller parties, I said before elections, we're going to see an interesting period of dynamic fragmentation in terms of which some parties are disappearing from the political scene, 
while others are beginning to gain steam. And those parties are going to be some national ones, but for the most part, we're going to see a lot of city-based parties, civic movements, and uh, 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 smaller parties that are based in specific regions. And I'm happy that the elections became truly an outcome of what I was talking about. But I must say that I didn't see that in that civic party, rich city-based party gaining 10% of the entire election, which is what the, the, the smaller parties together with the independents have between themselves, roughly 10% of the vote, another 10% to the EFF, uh, and then other uh, smaller, the, the DA and the ANC, and then other uh, parties as well who were not included in that other, in that you know, uh, IEC board. So in a nutshell, our electoral system is transforming. And my view is that what it's going to crystallize into, whether multi-party democracy or two-party or three-party, we will see it mainly in the, 20, in the period leading up to 2029. So come 2024, I think we will see a few coalitions at, a provincial, at provincial levels. I think the ANC will remain below 50% as a national average. I think the DA will still be fumbling and uh, you know, plateauing in terms of growth. It will, uh, there will be areas where it grows, there will be areas where it's declining. Uh, EFF likewise, um, I must say, I didn't get time to look specifically into Azapo. The key for me is that the, the, the party seems to be suffering the same challenge that has suffered parties whose key offering is around the issue of returning Azania and fighting for the land. My view is that this space, some of it is contained within the ANC in a fraction, some of it within the EFF, uh, and, 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 and some of it obviously as Apple PAC among others. What I foresee happening within this space is for the politics that is advanced within Azapo, PAC, uh, and to some degree EFF and, uh, and some degree ANC, there might just be a rise of a movement that consolidates this politics. Uh, but it's interesting that for now, unless there's a very clear uh, messaging around issues of common citizenship among other things, um, it, 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 it will always be battling as far as making a key offering that the electorate would, that would resonate with the electorate. Um, it's almost like a party that's gonna reside among intellectuals and would, 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 would battle to gain traction if there is no transformation that moves more to popular politics, if you like. And then the implications of that, my, okay, just to complete the picture in terms of what you asked, my view is that development, development in South Africa is going to be happening as a result of more and more people that are beginning to pay attention to the economic space. And it's going to happen despite the politics. So what we will see is rise of these civic movements that are linked to community organizations that are doing something about social ills, as opposed to like a national mother brand that does nothing at all. And in fact, if I think about it, if to the extent that Azapo associates itself with Miko, that's how Miko's approach was as well. You know, they are, the approach was start move black, the, 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 what, what were they called? Again, you will remind me, Mr. Chair, the black people's organizations, the organizations that were doing something about the plight of black people, as opposed to engaging in politics of perpetual protest with no solutions that are localized. So my view is that we are going to see a lot more people that play in that space. And that is going to bring about some solutions for cities which are going to address issues of poverty 
even and and the systemic in them will come as a result of the fact that more and more of this is happening in cities as opposed to the rise of a national movement that has got monopoly over the process. Thank you. Thanks, Ongama, and uh, that was a mouthful and uh, quite an interesting uh, narrative that you give there. And uh, I can see it's going to be an interesting afternoon uh, with regards to some of the issues that you are raising. And um, I just want to um, start off um, by, you know, just talking through some of the issues that you are raising. Um, maybe I should start off with the last one that um, you are referring to with regards to the Black community programs of the uh, Black People's uh, Convention. Uh, that is the program that uh, Ongama was talking to uh, with regards to the work that the BBC was doing through the you know, Black community programs. But a couple of things, uh, Ongama, that I want you to speak to. You speak of um, defragmentation of um, you know, the politics and of political parties um, and, and just the defragmentation of the political situation in the country, uh, which, is, which is quite um, an interesting observation. But would you say that um, that defragmentation is, um, is it not consolidating itself uh, to what's uh, the building of the neoliberalism in the country and uh, making neoliberalism as, uh, you know, uh, a, a point of convergence um, to the point where you, you find it very difficult to find opposition politics in the country. Uh, I'm, I'm battling, you know, from a political view uh, point to determine who is opposing who, you know, from a political perspective, other than, you know, the, you know, the competition between uh, business and capital. Are you still there? Yes, I am, sir. So, you, are you done with the question? No, no, no. I think I think uh, let, let's just um, uh, start there because we it, it talks to, um, to it talks to the decline uh, of the dominance of uh, the ANC. But um, you know, I'm saying you know the decline of the dominance of the ANC also speaks to uh, the prominence of um, you know, uh, neoliberalism and um, as as seen. Uh, we see in the South African Parliament today, because most of them are consolidating around uh, neoliberalism to a point of not knowing um, how uh, you know who is opposing who with regards to all of these uh, these things. Now, the, the the next question I wanted to just check with you is um, where are the people in all of this? Um, because we've seen, for instance, in the last election, that the majority of people have decided to withhold their vote. They abstain from voting. Is that an indication of the rejection of the political system as it exists in the country? Or is it a question of people saying, well, 1994, there was a promise of liberation. And now uh, what we are seeing is, um, as you put it, uh, people fighting for themselves, fighting for access to, um, to capital in a manner that benefits them as individuals and not so much you know, the people. Uh, the people for whom this struggle was fought have been put at the back burner and kind of ignored. And, and where are they in the discourse? And how should um, they be looked at? Are we, are we likely to see a popular a revolt as a result of, you know, people being ignored uh, in the process of politics. So that, that is one, uh, one aspect that I am, I'm really interested in. And the, the other thing that I wanted you to comment on is maybe now that um, you know, the elections have come and gone, what we see is um, you know, lots of discussions around coalition politics, and it is not very clear what informs you know, the thinking around these coalitions and what is the basis of you know parties uh, you know wanting to to partner with others except except one thing that is um, becoming clear that they just want the ANC out of government 
And, um, you know, it doesn't matter from a political orientation perspective who they are, for so long as the NC is out of it, um, you know, they are okay. So the coalition principle is based on kicking ANC out of, out of um, you know, the system. So again, it seems to me to be another consolidation of all of these political parties. It also speaks to, you know, what I was uh, mentioning earlier, that there is not much different between the political parties that exist. And perhaps it, it also explains why there isn't uh, many political parties of uh, the right or, or you know, of, of white people in this country, as, as opposed to the number of uh, political parties that are there uh, of black people. Um, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be desirable perhaps for all of these political parties of black people in parliament to consolidate themselves into uh, perhaps a single party in the much of time, because, uh, you know, politically speaking, uh, there's nothing that makes them different from each other and from one another. So that, that is um, one of the issues that I wanted you to, to comment on. Um, you did indicate earlier that you didn't spend much, uh, you know, of your time analyzing, you know, where Azapo is, and, and you see the land struggle as perhaps, uh, you know, the downfall of, 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 of organizations like the PAC and Azapo. And those are key principal struggles of these organizations. And if you see that as, as their downfall, what are the options available for them as, as they move forward? Because, um, you know, Azapo exists largely because of the need to uh, liberate uh, black people and return their land back. Uh, you know, that is one of the key, um, you know, principles of, of Azapo's um, involvement in struggle, the return of the land and, uh, the, you know, the dignity of black people. And we believe very strongly that the dignity of black people is linked to the return of the land. And now you're saying, um, you know, if we were to continue on this path, uh, it may be difficult for Azapo to grow. And maybe I, I should uh, stop there for now and allow you to, to comment on some of the issues I'm raising. Sure, so let me start with that question. So throughout the, throughout his, the history of colonialism and, 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 and post-colonial um, periods, the key question around nationhood in mm. colonized countries is the question of what the politics of either drive white people to the sea uh, and expropriate what they have, or integrationist politics of we, 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 we recognize the descendants of settler communities to live in South Africa, in, in, the, colon, in the former colony, and then drive politics of equitable access to land, right? Now, the reason why I talk about this is because the ANC was seen to be the advancing, and, and, and especially if we can look at that post-Congress of the people split, advancing a politics of South Africa belongs to all who live in it, um, and, 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 and that descendants of settler communities have as much claim as to land as their black counterparts and therefore approaches to transforming land ownership patterns need to move from the point of view of recognizing the mutual need for coexistence, the need for mutual coexistence. Now, other parties had an approach that said, no, you need to expropriate land on the basis of an approach to nationhood, which was somewhat exclusive. So it appears to me that, and, and, and I borrow from Kolela Manu when he makes uh, this characterization of various approaches to, to nationalism in South Africa, the radical strand and the conservative strand. It appears to me that uh, the, the conservative strand of African nationalism, the one that is more integrationist in its approach, has been the one 
that has had a longer uh, sustainability as something that remains in the hearts and minds of people uh, and that has been voted for. If we look at the fate of the ANC versus the PAC and Azapo, okay. Now, I, and I say and Azapo there carelessly because of this one issue, right? Otherwise, I mean, the po if you look at the, polit the politics prop of black consciousness, they it, it also advances a, a common citizenship, but challenging the power balances between the two races, but it's not a what, drive white people to the sea type of politics, the politics of, of, of black consciousness. Okay, so that's why I'm a little careful when I, when I mention it. Now, I started from this because I wanted to drive this point. If you look at the South African constitution, in fact, Mukai Toby calls it the anti-property clause, uh, section 25, because of the, uh, uh, the, the argument around this issue of just compensation and just compensation could be zero and the need for land to be returned to the people. But the politics of the constitution, the underlying politics of the constitution is a politics of South Africa belongs to all who live in it, but there's a need for redress compared to the rhetoric of South Africa belongs to black Africans and everybody else must, must leave the country. Now, nobody has spoken that message in those terms, like where there, but it's apparent in its rhetoric. If you look at the EFF over and above, uh, if you stopped and asked them the question, are you driving the politics that you should have every other group that's not inherit, that's not uh, indigenous to Africa, leave the country. That's not what they will say. But the campaigning the, the, is, a, is, is crafted as though that is the message, okay? So my view is that there is space in South Africa for radical politics of land redress. And in fact, my argument was that even the DA needed to accept this politics of land redress and expropriation even, because there are opportunities where expropriation makes sense even for the, for, for the support base of the DA. If you look at cities in South Africa, you'll find that there's a lot of rundown buildings that property owners are not improving, are not upgrading, and those have become dens of criminality. Now, if you advanced an expropriation debate there, it not, it not only makes the sense as far as redress is concerned, but it makes economic sense. It makes commercial sense to expropriate the building from somebody who allows it to be run down and give it to somebody who improves it for low cost housing. That makes specific sense, but that, doesn't have an exclusive uh, tone to it, a tone that says there are certain groups in South Africa that do not belong here. So my challenge to answer, to, to go back to your question, my answer as far as polit the political orientation of organizations agitating for greater access to land and transformation is that there seems to be a greater opportunity within integrationist politics for radical politics than there is for drive descendants of certain communities to the sea. Okay. So can I, uh, can I just, <clears throat> sorry, can I just, um, um, you know, even before we move on to, to other discussion points, uh, maybe we need to explore this a little bit. Um, because I, I realize that some of you as, as uh, you know, analysts and, and political scientists, um, I don't know whether it's, it's a misunderstanding of, um, you know, this whole debate around, um, you know, expropriation or whole debate around land. Because, you know, the narrative that is out there, you know, for some of you is really about, uh, you know, variant, uh, variances in the forms of expropriation. And, and, you know, the Black Consciousness Movement has really never spoke of or spoken of expropriation because 
You know, I think the fundamental principle and difference is that when you speak of expropriation, we are assuming that uh, this land belongs to those, um, you know, uh, that are owning it right now and that are, you know, occupying it right now. And, and forgetting that those people are occupying that land illegally and are occupying that land which does not belong to them. Because I think that, that should be the starting point, that the land does not belong to them. And therefore, if it doesn't belong to them, then the question of expropriation doesn't even begin to arise. And I don't know why uh, it is that we are so fixated on you know, expropriation instead of agreeing that you know, the land belongs to black people. And if we move from that premise, then the discussion gets easier because um, you, you stop you know, talking expropriation and you talk about how do you then repossess that which belongs to black people. Because you know, in that in that discourse, you're not even saying where should white people go. Um, the assumption should be that we we all uh, are inhabitants of this land, but the land that we are, in, are inhabiting right now does not belong to those who live in it. It belongs to black people, like land in in the UK belongs to uh, the British, like land in 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 Russia belongs to Russians. And I, I, I think we need to move from that premise because once we have that understanding, then we begin to talk about the return of the land. We, 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 be, we begin to talk about how, the, how do we go about repossessing the land that um, you know, white people are, are occupying on behalf of uh, black people. Because you know, the, the, this concept of expropriation assumes that we all accept that the land belongs to white people and therefore, uh, we should therefore accept that uh, there should be mechanisms of accommodating uh, whiteness instead of accommodating blackness in the discourse. Sure. So, so let me come in. And there I'm going to borrow from um, Ubuntu, ne? Yeah. Uh, among some of the things <clears throat> in my response. History is not one grand narrative of, it's not one grand narrative or one story. If you look at the story of the Eastern Cape, for example, yeah. you will find that, and in fact, Jeff Perez makes this point and Jeff Perez uh, in his book, House of Palo, was yes. the first production of a, 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 a book that, that that's mostly a, recognizing or in the voice uh, in the voices of abantu in its production so yeah. so so one of the things he makes is that look amakosa for example the issue of access to land was not an issue that was commercialized to the extent yeah. that if you asked for land you were go, you you you, you needed it, it needed to be a, a commercial transaction so he mm. makes the point that as settlers were coming in, there were variations of one, there's a war, and then it results in limitations of in territories being taken. But another one was the approach where somebody comes, goes to the king, the king says, no, you can settle at such and such a place. Uh, because anyway, as long as you paid homage to the existing king, the, we, we don't have an approach to ownership of land that says, no, it's exclusive. So the point that Jeff actually, to make this point, Jeff goes and says, look at how the so-called Amamfengu are treated in Tosalet. Ne? Yeah. Look at how the various nations that migrate into land already occupied by Amakosa. Ah, and look at relationships between Amakosa and Abatwa and notions of citizenship. So the very notion of ownership of land is in fact colonial. So, 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 so and, and in fact was never the means of determining citizenship among African groups as, as a, or, or, well, there would be issues of territoriality, okay, but but, 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 but it was not like you, you, you for, 
people who are of foreign origin will not be given land because of this, that, and the other. Now, never mind the fact that that is bastardized through the process of colonialism. So yeah. to resolve that, you don't, if we are truly want to be African, in us attempting to resolve the issue of land, then it means we must disregard the very notion of ownership, if you like. If we are, if we are going to appeal to our Africanness, then it yeah. means the very notion, which is called a colonial construct, must too be problematized. Because Galoku, what guides us is Ubuntu, which is why that, oh, that whole issue of that whole issue of uh, 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 you know, that thing of it, 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 I mean, look at the hospitality sector. There's no concept of hospitality sector in, in the Tosa culture. I mean, fortunately, I grew up in that, in that, and there was hospitality minus the profit interests in it. And it was uh, 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 where I grew up in Moshua. It was the last remnant of pre-colonial living in my in my, where if there's somebody who's passing by, there was no commercial transaction for lodging. Mm -hmm. And in fact, issues of allocations of land were still being made, and there was no Ndoba, we are Uvanje in a community to hang manyasa, those ones, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and their particular attitudes towards them. But that they have tenure over a specific land that was given by chief or king so and so or smonda so and so it is never an issue that's going to be problematized at a certain stage so my view is that we must approach the issue of land distribution truly truly we must recognize the injustice that is suffered by black people yeah with that, and 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 in fact not afraid to even expropriate farms of speculators, people who are uh, holding 10 farms and uh, they, are commercial, they, they have commercial activities in one. Debates must be had about, no, look, you've got, uh, uh, let's say, a, 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 a thousand hectares. I don't know what's that called. Uh, okay, you've got a thousand. Mm. Sorry? No, no, it's fine. Continue. Yeah, you've got a thousand hectares of land. You are farming two hundred. Let's talk about and and by the way, the history of this land that you are farming is that it was expropriated. Sorry, it was it was it was stolen from so and so at the war of Mlangi, or whatever the case may be. Now we will recognize the value that your family has put here, but in the rest of the land, we've got to debate issues of how that land can be availed for greater public good. So, 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 so my view is the constitutional view that says, have ways in which you recognize that some people would have acquired land by purchasing it. And you don't want to expropriate the land which people have purchased. But at the same time, you may find that, I mean, we know, fortunately, history is there. We know lands where, they were taken out of a certain war. And I think I want to align myself with Mugai Toby's approach that says that land, there are ways in which it can be uh, taken and be given back to the beneficiaries in line with the constitution, or there may be ways to recognize it using spiritual approaches, using cultural approaches and other things which guarantee access for certain things while at the same time, not violating the rights of people who are there now. Uh, so, so my view, I, I'm more for the complex solutions to the South African problems than the easier and simpler ones, which trigger war. And one of the things I, 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 I sub schools as I subscribe to is that in history, we must avoid being caught up in a perpetual cycle of one generation is po politically and militarily powerful and uses that political and military power to violate another who then become the underdogs and engage in their own struggle. And then once they become the top dogs, they then engage in another military power process, which put them at the top and creates 
pain in another group and and creates this ongoing cycle so so yeah <laughs> I don't, I don't know. know. I hear you, but what I want to say, you know, before we move uh, forward with this conversation, is that um, I hear you, and um, I think we need a more penetrative discussion around, uh, you know, the land debate, uh, because I don't necessarily agree with you, and neither do I necessarily agree with uh, Nugai Tovi uh, in his um, exposition there. But what uh, we may just want to close off on, on this discussion point is um, that integration politics in this country are largely assimilation of uh, blackness to whiteness. And, and you know, those of uh, you who say we must maybe consider integration politics and be integrationist in our approach, do not want to accept that black consciousness is in essence an integrationist um, uh, orientation with regards to how uh, you know society needs to evolve, because black consciousness actually says uh, it recognizes um, that you know we 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 have all of these people who live in this country, but there must be an understanding that this land belongs to black people and that those who would want to continue to live in it must you know, must allow themselves to be subjected to the view that Black people have about what they want to do about the future of the land. And they will be integrated to live in this country in terms as determined by the owners of the land. And right now, the integrationist approach that you are talking about is that of us assimilating to those who are occupying the land. Because they, 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 you know, they have the levers to power. We don't have those levers, and um, yeah. But but we need to have a more penetrating discussion around around this land debate. It is very clear to me. But maybe you can just uh, move on to you know to other issues uh, so that we don't belabor this point. Sure. So if I may, uh, there's a colleague who, who who puts and I and by the way, my view is that it is. I, I believe in systems. I'm a general yeah. living systems uh, theorist. My view is that the solutions that we, we mustn't be shy from difference. Yeah. We must express difference. And life, in my view, is designed divinely so that the outcome of the ongoing processes of conflict and, uh, and difference would yield solutions that are greater than when, where I started when I was talking to you and also where you started when you started speaking to me. And yeah. I believe that the political system in South Africa is changing to allow for that to happen. The fact that you are now having a decline, just to go back to one of your questions, the fact that you are now having a decline of a dominant party with pockets of power in different in settings, it's bringing us to a place where we can be a lot more listening to one another and have solutions to our problems, which are greater than the individual positions that we hold uh, individually. And so in my view, that is that underscores the interdependence that's in our land. And then as far as the rest of the debate, let, allow me, I've, I'm, I'm building a a, 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 a paper that I will work focus on after my PhD. It's called Alternative Political Institution Building from Isikosa Proverbs. Yeah. There, I go and I extract from our sense of selves, our Africanness. What is it from it that is instructive and is actually showing how Amakosa would design political and economic institutions that are not the, 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 the different strands of philosophy that we are fighting about, which come from the West, whether yeah. on the right or on the left. So I will work on that project and I'll reach out to you for this platform again once I've finished it, because there I think it will reconcile for you how some of us are going back to our sense of Africanness, while at the same time appreciating the cumulative insights we've gained as a result of our colonial experience 
in ways that make a, the, 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 because what I appreciate from what you said is that black consciousness seeks to integrate in a way that rebalances the power skates, in a yeah. way that doesn't take away power from black people when mm. integration happens. And, I, and I, am, I, I am a proponent of that. And I, am an, I, I, I advance an argument, in fact, that says Western thought, it's time for you to listen to the knowledges that you thought were, 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 were barbaric. And because of that, you precluded yourself from gaining the insights from different ways of thinking about the world. So, 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 the, but anyway, that's for, for, for a separate debate. But yeah. uh, on the question of neoliberalism, I think that uh, the, the settlement as far as ideology is concerned in South Africa is going to be along a continuum of center, center left and slightly center right. There isn't going to be victory for neoliberalism, uh, but at the same time, we're not gonna go to the left. Um, my view is that the cumulative outcome of the political arrangements and economic arrangements we are seeing are going to be centrist. And in fact, my argument is that we are, we are going to see even business recognize centrist uh, politics as opposed to free marketism. And my view is that this is what's going to help us to deal with our problems the recognition by all in society that you cannot want to be completely free market, nor can you want to be completely anti-market. You are going to have a solution where there are elements of strongly center left and strongly centrist and to some degree, uh, some, 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 some neoliberal solutions that are go all going to add to a system that is greater than its constitutive parts. Mm. I'm in conversation with uh, Ongama Mtinka, and if you want to join this conversation, you're more than welcome to drop your comments on the chat platform uh, or on the Q&A &A tab, and you're also welcome to raise your hand and uh, make your contribution, um, either by way of a question or a comment uh, on the discussion thus far. So um, if, if I have seen a couple of uh, comments coming through already, um, if, if um, yeah, here's Kekeles was saying, integration politics have not worked. Um, we have uh, forced black people to assimilate to whiteness and uh, there was never integration. And secondly, equality from a place of inequality is impossible. How do you propose we do this? Uh, without intellectualizing this and bringing it um, home for me. Ongama, I want to live at the top of the mountain. To do that, I must pay uh, Smith 1.4 million for that land, which the king would have given uh, it uh, to me for free. How do I reconcile this then? Uh, white people, um, what is this one? White people have abused Ubuntu. We, where we are, because of Ubuntu, we were kind to the enemy and he took and personalized what uh, you say was communal. His system excluded me and has impoverished and disadvantaged me. How do I deal with that? And here are a couple of comments from our Facebook platform. And um, Mlungi Sidongo says, for analysts, it's an exercise of ideas. But for us, it's a tool to change the material conditions of the marginalized Blacks in Africa. And he continues to say, we should listen to analysts and refine our posture, but very few will be able to guide us in our mission. They don't fully understand or comprehend uh, what we are about. And this is now an example of a colonial education system. Analysts failed to objectively tell you know, the African history and they are veiled by their Eurocentric teaching. And uh, we are made guilty for wanting land repossession. We are branded as racist. And the narrative of popular analysts is to caricature the Africanist view. Like Luanda, our people are deluded and feel guilty of asserting that land belongs to Africans. Um, and maybe we as African, uh, Africanist parties have failed to offer real leadership to redirect the masses towards our teachings. 
and these leaders uh, in front of us uh, in the big parties have been hard at work to surpass us even when with uh, or even with a weaker ideology they are out here making noise and getting support why should people follow our parties just because we claim to represent the Africanist plight and yes uh, Bert Muyaha saying is it wrong uh, for Azapo to be a party of intellectuals and um, gets a hand date in shaping a new political landscape the problem with Azapo is her silence for a long time when the ruling elite was mismanaging uh, the resources of the state and as well as corruption. Um, and uh, here's another one saying, uh, I agree that it's difficult to decipher who is opposing who. Uh, Arc enemies are sitting on coalition tables. Um, and here's uh, Lou Vuko. Itamani is saying, unite with PAC, BLF, and any other pro-Black organization and save the lives of Black people from drugs, poverty, ill education, etc. And South Africans are dying. They need Black um, unity foreigners and have surrounded our communities. We need intervention as of today, open uh, Black banks, insurance companies, etc. We have the support of the people. They just need to hear a right voice. Um, and here's uh, Chris Webber saying, this is a um, great informative platform by Azapo, continue doing the work. Um, yeah, those are the comments thus far. Um, maybe you would want to uh, give a view on what you've heard and what people are saying. I think I like the uh, the most part of what that uh, comment, the, 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 the person who says, uh, we have limits as analysts, and I think, but, but I like, I'm covered by what he says, that we must listen to them, uh, and obviously you will make what you make. I don't subscribe to the colonial approach that says knowledge produced in institutions of higher learning is the ultimate knowledge. I grew up in a rural area, and it's amazing what knowledge we have from there about a whole range of issues. And in fact, when I decided to leave full-time employment in communications, I compared my life with the life of my grandfather who had standard two, that free life acquired a lot of assets which I grew up in, uh, working in. Okay, so, so I think it's presumptuous that comment who thinks that uh, we are only our products of universities. I mean, that's just shallow. But I, 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 I am a product of ru a rural, uneducated people whose brilliance put me where I am today. And today, when I speak, I am not speaking as a westernized subject devoid of my sense of self. I mean, I'd have to, I would have to deny the entire upbringing experience, the very upbringing experience, which actually made me to leave full-time employment uh, and go contribute to building things for, 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 for whether it's helping somebody to, uh, and I'm happy you, now I'm happy you read that profile, so whether it's helping <laughs> many people we've helped with business plans to run businesses or uh, coaching people to run better NPOs, Whatever the case may be, you know, the, on the 25th, I'm going to be on a platform where we are launching a, a project where people are going to be leveraging a project where one company is investing in 10 million rand infrastructure. Those guys are going to operate community Wi-Fi by themselves, right? But if, if we had a colonial approach, we could have easily said, because we were in a position of power to advise, we could have easily said to these guys, go find a company that can do this. We said there are people who've got knowledge who just lack opportunity. If you create this infrastructure, we will find them, we will operate this thing and it will be beneficial to their communities. They will help provide a free service while they make profit somewhere. Okay, uh, so, 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 there are more ways in which many of us should be responding to questions of the national problem than just politicking and writing about things and itolopezul. I'm one of those people who strongly believe in the, and thank you for bringing the word again. I think you said Black People's Convention, or, you know, the, 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 and there are evidence of it everywhere. 
it's more gratifying to be involved in politics of polarization where the rhetoric sounds very radical and we clap hands for you than it is to devote your entire life working to solve community problems. And in fact, in South Africa, we have a very silly attitude where the guy who goes and shouts in the street corners about banishing people has gives it gets given greater reward than many women that are working in their communities to transform the lives of orphans and vulnerable children. We are a twisted society. We will reward loud mouths more than we reward people who work with their hands and with their hearts and with their minds to help communities transform their lives. My argument is that as Miko showed us, to transform society doesn't take just good speech. It also takes rolling out your sleeves, starting up a crash, rolling out your sleeves, coaching uh, people. Um, if you've got metric and you are good in maths, you don't wait until you've got money one day, you realize your privilege and go and help people who are in standard six with mathematics. It's not only white monopoly capital or emergent black bourgeoisie or the wealthy that can be changed. And in fact, if you go into communities where we come from, you will find that what makes those communities resilient are the, is the care that is built into communities, which has allowed Uzbek Tengesh's child who was poor to grow up in that house that had many sheep and all that he needed to do was to tend to the sheep while being educated. And now they have become a successful person. So unfortunately, I don't subscribe to this idea of one silver lining policy or ideological framework that is an answer to all of our problems. I limit myself to the complex issues of helping 10 people. And when you ask me as an ideologue, uh, and I'm not talking about you now, Mr. Ashe. <laughs> when, when an ideologue asks me, uh, what is it that I'm contributing? And I say, with humility, I'm just changing lives of 10 people uh, in a project that I'm running and I'm paying for with my own family's resources. And they tell me, no, just, just peace, peace me. It's not changing the structure of oppression. I'm happy with that. Because one thing we must realize as humans, we, can, we are only here to contribute the best that we can individually and collectively working in organizations, but we must be humble about what its impact will be. It can never be systemic. What makes, what generates systemic impact? Uh, the critical mass of individuals working and responding in their own local setting and generating systemic results rather than this which we are being sold by politicians that if you vote for this party then they are going to have systemic a, a change of a transformation of systemic proportions which is going to resolve all of our problems so i'm not there i'm more for communities that are working and are resilient and are working and, and in those and in every community you go to in south africa you will find people that are rainmakers and we talk less about them because some of them are not educated. They don't have the platforms that we have. And, 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 and in fact, us who are able to mobilize in political settings, we think we are better than those people because they don't have an ideology or they don't talk or preach about a particular ideology. So I'm not there. I'm not, I don't have a monopoly of solutions. I know what I am humbly contributing towards, and I'm happy that it's going to happen in my lifetime. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested uh, because I'm seeing by time is almost up, but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in your view about, um, you know, the future of this country. You know, where are we going, maybe, you know, in the next 20 years or so? Uh, you did indicate earlier that you see an emergence of uh, civic movements uh, largely um, and these uh, perhaps taking over, you know, from political parties. But you know, civic movement, movements largely deal with local issues. You know, the yeah. support by street. I don't have water. I don't have this or that. It does not, um, you know, respond to the decay that we see uh, overarching uh, in the country. 
uh, you know, the decay in the education system, uh, you know, the decay in the running of the state, and, and you know, and, and, and such issues. They deal with, you know, specific uh, issues that impact, you know, certain communities. You know, we don't have uh, working toilets and, you know, these big latrines have been here forever and they need to, remove, to be removed. So, you know, politically, how do we see uh, you know, the, the country uh, getting out of the morass that we are finding it now? Sure, thank you for having me. So, uh, and it's been such a, a lovely time and you're quite right, the time has run up. But let me answer your, your, your question, sir. Here is my view. You see, when in 1994 we transitioned into democracy, we created a world of everybody for themselves and God for us all, right? And we lived in our position of a privilege and forgot about the mutual pain of everybody else in the country. And we are beginning to pay for it. Now, my belief is this, that the flare ups of things like the insurrection we saw recently, rampant crime and the transformation of South Africa into a unworkable state is going to push all of us away from our comfort zones into a world where we are no longer living for ourselves and our families, but we, are called, we recognize our mutual vulnerability despite the high walls that we have created we, behind which we live. And it is that recognition of mutual vulnerability to the social ills that confront us that's going to push us to tear down the walls and find solutions for our problems as a country. And in fact, we are going to recognize that our problems are not with some grand political messiah. They are not with some grand uh, political entrepreneur or entrepreneur. They are with us recognizing how we need one another and how we leverage our uh, the, the resources that we individually have or collectively have in order to make life better for others. That's the only thing I have comfort and hope in, that as life becomes more dangerous in South Africa, despite our, uh, our, our high walls, we are going to recognize that not doing something about the pain of others is a big problem. And we are going to be uncomfortable about living in relative wealth while others live in poverty and we will take action. So if rhetoric could never take us into action, the pain of, of living in a country where you must watch your back all the time, you must get a gun and all of those things is gonna force us into a situation. And I think that South Africans thrive in that space. And we were going to see something beautiful here that is going to dis that, that is going to be a uh, defying odds and 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 i can yeah i, I don't want to go into the realm of what what's underlying this belief let me leave it there before i i i i, I tap into my spiritual self <laughs> thanks for spending your afternoon with us it's been a great conversation and we look forward to future conversations with you and that's where we leave it for today. And let's meet again uh, two o'clock on Sunday next week. And uh, goodbye. And thank you for spending. Taking the power back